Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, get started. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, Dan Nardi's uh, Q&A session last week. Who wants to go in on a startup? I'm, I'm inspired, I don't know about you. All right, great. So uh, let's make sure we understand a little bit about HCI before we start our startup. Back to lecture, uh, we're gonna talk about deliverable nine in a moment. We are uh, approaching the end of the deliverables. We are working our way through this theme on looking outward. So thinking about not just creating pretty websites, but thinking about designing technology, which is interacting in real time uh, in the real world alongside their human users. And we're looking at some of the unique challenges and opportunities that such ubiqu ubiquitous computing uh, affords. Uh, just a reminder today, uh, noon to 4 p.m., I'm sure you've heard this many times now already, but if you haven't, uh, this afternoon on the fourth floor of Davis Center, if you're looking for a job, that's the place to be. Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, finish the last couple of uh, slides in lecture 15, which is sort of broadening our discussion about interactive technology, where we're looking now not at GUIs or graphical user interfaces, but thinking about how to uh, bring into account the other sense organs like audition and touch. And we'll finish our discussion of touch today. We'll talk a little bit about what ubiquitous computing actually is. We will finish this lecture today and start in on the first of three lectures we're going to have that look at deploying a particular kind of ubiquitous technology to ask and try to answer a scientific question that would be difficult or impossible to do without technology which is threaded into the physical environment. Okay, so that's where we were and where we're going. Um, I'm going to start lecture and then we're gonna come back to deliverable nine about partway through the lecture because I wanna introduce the concept of scaffolding, which is what you're gonna be tackling in deliverable nine. Okay. So just as a reminder, uh, we ended last time uh, by talking about tactile user interfaces. Can we create technologies that communicate back through us through touch and what would be the advantages of communicating through touch rather than projecting a visual feedback? What were some of the advantages we talked about last week? We talked about TUIs. Why bother creating a moving pin display that we can actually feel uh, feedback, physical feedback from the device? You can actually like physically interact with a, a space that's away from you. A absolutely, right? So this idea of physical interaction, if we're, if we're interacting with someone or something else, a lot of that communication is through touch and through skin, right? We can imagine through tactile user interfaces that multiple people and multiple computers or technologies can collectively manipulate objects uh, and create or do something together. And there is an important aspect of tactile feedback in that process. I skipped over last time uh, Ultra Haptics, which I think is a particularly interesting example of a tangible user interface. This one is going to, as you'll see in a moment, provide tactile feedback, but also visual feedback and combine them in an interesting way. So let's have a look at Ultra Haptics and then we will uh, talk about the technology itself. This one, pay particular attention to the feedback loop. Remember we talked uh, in the beginning of the course about the output or the interaction of the user becomes the input to the device and vice versa. That feedback loop exists here, but it's a little bit difficult and a little bit subtle to see what is involved in that feedback loop. Okay, let's have a look. Interactive surfaces are now common in every... Interactive surfaces are now common in everyday life. They allow users to walk up and use them with no instruction. However, current methods for providing tactile feedback require the user to cover up the visual content by touching the display or attach devices to their hands. We present Ultra Haptics, a system that provides mid-air haptic feedback and requires no contact with either tools, 
attachments, or the surface itself. Ultra Haptics uses a phased array of ultrasound transducers to create tactile focal points in mid-air. The array is driven by a stack of five driver boards, which receive emission patterns from a PC. The user's hands are tracked by a leap motion controller and the haptic feedback is projected through an acoustically transparent display directly onto the user's bare hands. There are four steps to our unique focusing method. First, we define a large volume around the transducer array within which we will model the ultrasound field. Then, we position positive control points where we want to form focal points. These tell the system to generate the highest intensity ultrasound possible at these locations. They are then surrounded with null control points. These have the opposite effect, telling the system to generate the lowest intensity ultrasound at these locations. Finally, the phase delay and amplitude are calculated for each transducer in the array to create an acoustic field that matches the control points. This simulation illustrates the acoustic field as we move up from the transducer array. Color represents phase and brightness represents intensity. At a height of 20 centimeters, a focal point is formed. Above, the ultrasound defocuses once more. Similarly, this simulation shows five discrete focal points being formed at the same time. By varying the tactile properties of focal points, such as the frequency, they can be made to feel different from each other. In this scenario, a tactile information layer is created above the display. By moving their hand over the map, the user can feel the population density of a city. The frequency of a focal point represents the density in that area. Here, focal points are created above elements of a music player interface. This allows a user to locate themselves on the interface without looking. Tapping the focal point above the button starts and stops the music. The focal point above the volume slider can be grabbed at this point, it pulses to inform the user that the system has recognized their grasp. The focal point can then be slid up and down to change the volume. These are just a few of the applications that become possible with the ultra haptic system. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the feedback loop in ultra haptics. What, what is involved in this feedback loop? A motion sensor, so a sensor that's detecting motion. It's tracking the hand location. It's tracking the hand location. So we've got a familiar friend here as part of the feedback display. The leap motion device, as you know, is capturing information about where the hand is and hand orientation. That's the input to the ultra haptic system. What is the input to the user? So, yeah, and I apologize for the sound. You can go back and watch the video at your leisure. So these phased arrays that are underneath the hand, or in some cases, in this case, projecting from above downward, are a set of phased ultrasonic uh, emitters. So they're emitting ultrasound, which is not unlike the infrared in the leap motion device. It is a physical phenomenon that sends out a wave and in some cases detects the uh, the uh, the feedback from the wave, but in this case, the wave that's being emitted is felt by the user's hand. How? Absolutely. They mentioned these positive and negative focal points. So these phased arrays are all emitting a series of ultrasonic waves. And the device itself can control the phase offset of the waves and the frequency of the waves. 
So you've all, you've all probably seen a body of water. You have two waves that are approaching one another. And if they hit at ju in just the right uh, phase, if they come together at the same time, they produce positive interference. You get a, a wave that is larger than either individual wave. That's in this case, the positive focal point. Imagine these waves that are coming out of the bottom of the phased array, or if the phased array is placed above the hand pointing down, these waves are coming down, and these waves are hitting one another at an exact position in three-dimensional space. And if your fingers happen to be very near that point of positive interference, you feel a vibration which feels something like something is there that is resisting your grasp. And you can see in this example of the music player interface, you could simulate something like a knob or a button or a, or a key press. Sure. They're sound waves, absolutely, at a certain frequency. Yep. No, it is beyond human hearing, which is kind of interesting. You could imagine also adding in an auditory feedback. You can feel these waves rather than hear them. Okay, so that's a positive uh, interference point. You can create a negative uh, control point where you, you set the phase offset so that they are out of phase. And again, you've seen in a body of water, two waves that approach one another and they're off by a little bit and they sort of cancel each other out and you get mean height, right? So in this case, they create, if they're trying to simulate a knob that can be grasped, they project or they set the frequency and phase offsets of these ultrasonic emitters to produce vibration at this particular point and everywhere around that point they're trying to cancel out these waves minimize their frequency so it doesn't feel like there's anything there right that's creating a discrete point in space and then they gave this sort of uh, example of a map where you have some continuous increase in interference which feels like something that's increasingly rough Obviously, there's nothing there, but it gives the per perception that as you move your hand over the map, you're feeling increasing population density or some distribution of data distributed over a two-dimensional plane. That's the idea. It's kind of interesting and neat, but why would one want to do that? What's the advantage of being able to simulate a three-dimensional object that someone can reach in and manipulate even when it's not there? They showed you a couple applications. Where else might this be useful? Absolutely, right? So there's a visual component to this particular application, but you don't necessarily need a visual component. Right? Other ideas? They mentioned in passing in the video that this might be useful for applications where the user doesn't actually need to be looking where they're grasping. Absolutely, it could be useful in, in a case like that. There are a lot of domains where uh, they pay very careful attention to heads-up display, like working on the space station or other uh, off-Earth applications. Uh, in military applications, there's a lot of potential information, and you need to think very carefully about providing enough information for the human user to make intelligent decisions in real time, but obviously not overwhelm, overwhelm them. One strategy is not to simply produce more and more visual feedback, but to take feedback and shunt it to different sense organs. So there's visual display and tactile display. If I'm focusing on something visual, I might be able to reach outside of my visual field and feel something and manipulate it without having to take my attention off whatever it is that I'm looking at. Uh, you can have this in like a public space where sanitary concerns could be something like it, people are the, handling a touch screen. The, like yeah, absolutely. That's a great example, right? A social context where you prefer people aren't actually touching uh, an object. Or you, you maybe can develop a game, then you can yeah, play the game by bare hand. Absolutely, right? It'd be kind of interesting to be where you're reaching in and manipulating arbitrary objects. Imagine that you have control over the frequencies and phase offsets of this array. How complex an object could you project that would 
project the illusion of that object actually being there. Imagine trying to do that and ask your user to reach into this field and describe the object that's inside uh, the field of the, the array. Could be kind of interesting. Imagine a lot of potential applications. Okay. So I introduced last time, but we didn't have a time, chance to look at it, the second uh, application. This is the actuated workbench. If we can create a feedback loop where the device is also providing physical feedback to the user, you can imagine users and the technology itself collaboratively manipulating, in this case, a real object. The actuated workbench consists of an 8x8 array of electromagnets. It uses magnetic attraction and repulsion to move magnetic objects two-dimensionally on a flat surface. Here we can see a magnet moving in stepwise Manhattan motion. Here we see an object moving in a smooth circular pattern. Although the array of electromagnets is fixed, the system can create smooth motion by varying the strength of the electromagnetic fields. In addition to magnets, the electromagnetic array can move any small ferromagnetic object, such as a paperclip. Here the user controls the puck's motion with a trackball. Smaller objects can be moved much faster, though their motion is not always so smooth. Magnets of different sizes and shapes behave differently in the system's magnetic fields. This stack of small magnets jumps around whimsically. We use computer vision as a preliminary object tracking technology. Here the user records a path by moving the puck on the surface, and the system then replays that path through magnetic actuation. The blue projection around the puck is a graphical visualization of the strength of each adjacent magnetic field. Here is an example application intended to teach users about physics. The red projected area on the surface represents a zone of attractive force, while the blue area represents repulsive force. The user can feel these forces by lightly holding the puck in different areas of the board. When the user releases the puck, it flies to the red zone of the board to which it is attracted. Magnetic drawing toys are effective for visualizing the actuated workbench's magnetic fields. A magnet doodle allows us to see the fields used to trace the smooth circular path shown at the beginning of this video. The Dapper Dan toy lets us see the magnetic activity in the movements of iron filings on the surface. The actuated workbench can be used to control the planchette in a Ouija board game. Very practical. <laughs> like other robust systems, such as the Diamond Touch, presented by Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs in WIS 2001, the actuated workbench works even when set on fire. <laughs> the uh, last very important demo there, of course, that's a nod to uh, robotics demos. Whenever you create a video of your robot, you should always set it on fire at the end to demonstrate it's very robust. Okay, actuated workbench. What's the feedback loop here? So we just saw ultra haptics where they're using ultrasound to create this tactile feedback loop. What's the physical phenomenon being exploited here? <clears throat> Electromagnetic waves or fields, right? Okay, so what does this feedback loop afford? 
We saw a few examples of feedback between human users and the device. What are some of those collaborative actions that the two can perform using this technology? How might this be useful? How might it not be useful? Oh, well, uh, this is kind of far fetched, but like um, in like JPL and JPL has they explore things like the the sun um, emits um, various or something like even like Jupiter emits um, electromagnetic fields, which is why um, Juno, their spacecraft, mm -hmm. has to be large enough. Um, so that it wouldn't get sucked into the field of, of Jupiter and okay. waste billions of uh, taxpayer mm -hmm. funding. Um, so having something like that would be great to simulate the field of like a planet okay. or the sun to see how over time it could interact with um, spaceships or planets nearby. Sure, sure, right. So an educational or training application, you could imagine a lot of educational applications here. How might these applications, if you were to create an educational application or a training application with this device, what advantages would it have over a more traditional way of teaching electromagnetic fields and interactions of large bodies with electromagnetic fields? Moving objects in real time. Moving objects in real time, right? You can see the object itself, and if you hold on to the object, you can physically feel the effects of an electromagnetic field, which we can't see on objects. Right? One of the biggest challenges in education is taking an abstract concept and trying to make it concrete in some way. Right? So you can imagine the actuated workbench here as providing unique opportunities to concretize particular abstract concepts like electromagnetism. OK. Forget electromagnets for a moment. What else might you be able to teach better using this technology than others? You're all in the process of building an educational system, and hopefully the Leap Motion device will provide your users with you and your users with opportunities to learn ASL better than if you just showed them a whole bunch of YouTube videos and they practiced in response to the videos. There's something about the interaction with the Leap Motion device that facilitates learning. What here might be able to facilitate learning over doing it in a more traditional sense? I like the, the fact that it is robotic motion. Okay. So things like algorithms, like um, there's a lantern and it's hands. So a type of algorithm, you go left and go right. And you could physically see if you had someone um, program a robot or perform an algorithm, mm -hmm. the um, course it would go. Okay, so you could program Chris Langton's aunt, which is a simple agent, and learn a little bit about AI and path planning. What other domains might it be useful to teach using this device? Chess. Chess. There's an interesting idea. Yep. How many of you have learned to try and write in another language, have learned kanji or some other language that requires fine motor skills? Imagine someone, an expert in kanji signing various, uh, various symbols using this device, and then the user holds the device and their hand is pulled through the process of uh, drawing kanji characters. Right? You can imagine for teaching languages or written expression, perhaps that would be useful. One of the biggest challenges in learning a sport or chess or anything that's tactile, writing a language, obviously it has a lot to do with the hands. You can watch the hands of the teacher from a distance and try and replicate that with your own hands. Very difficult to do because you're going from the tactile sense to the visual sense and translating back into your own tactile sense. It would be nice to cut out the middleman, vision in this case, and allow, in a sense, the teacher's hands to become your own hands. You could imagine whether that would work or not, but that's the way of trying to think about this, right? We want to try and come up with unique learning opportunities that would be difficult or impossible to do without the technology itself. 
Okay, so that concludes our discussion of tactile interfaces. We're gonna switch now and talk about this general field of ubiquitous computing, which is sort of a subfield of HCI. We're gonna stitch technology directly into the physical world and what are some of the unique challenges there. I started the beginning of the semester with this little cartoon here. Um, way back in the Stone Age, we had all these humans and a small minority of them had uh, desktop computers. And within a few years, there were more, many more cell phones out there than laptops and desktops. Cell phones and com traditional computers have lots of differences, but for our purposes, our phones are interacting with us, but also interacting more directly with the real world than our computers are. Modern smartphones have a, a large number of sensors in them, which, unless you turn them off, they are recording various information in real time. We're gonna start in the applications uh, in the next few lectures to look at embedded devices. So these are devices that also have a lot of sensors and are also direct, uh, interacting directly with some field of view around them. A simple example would be the motion sensors over in the Davis Center. The sensors themselves don't move, but they are sensing in real time, something about the real world, independent of whether there are people around or not. And towards the end of this section on looking outward, we're gonna look at robots, which from an HCI perspective are nothing more than self-moving embedded devices. Robots over embedded devices are able to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Okay, so this is the world that we're moving towards and there are some important HCI challenges and opportunities in doing this right. That's what we're talking about in ubiquitous computing, which you can think of as putting computation out there into the world. And if we do it well, the technology disappears into the world. How many CPUs are there in this room right now? A lot, that's a good guess. Who knows, right? Hopefully, I'm, luckily, we're all not aware of each other's cell phones. We know they're out there. There's a bunch of CPUs out here. There's one in here. There's one in there. It's out there, and a lot of those CPUs are doing active work for us at the moment and are helping support this activity of learning about ubiquitous computing. But hopefully, most of the time, the technology is not, you're not aware of the technology, and instead, you're resting on that technology and using it to learn about ubiquitous computing. How do we create ubiquitous technology that is invisible? This is an idea that goes way back to the early 1980s. Uh, Ken Sakamura at the University of Tokyo was one of the founding uh, fathers of uh, ubiquitous computing, uh, and he wanted to put computers everywhere. Even back in the 1980s when personal computers were just getting started, uh, Professor Sakamura had the, had the insight that even if every single person on the planet bought a desktop and eventually a laptop, we're probably not going to have 10 or 20 computers. But we may have many, many more devices which are computerized. This was a pretty insightful observation way back in the 1980s. So the number of embedded devices a human uses is limited only by the number of uses you can think of them. So inside your laptop, there are a number of CPUs. In your day-to-day -day life, among the objects that you own, where else are there CPUs? Everything. Your car, your phone, kitchen appliances, absolutely. Wi-Fi router. Okay, if you have a laptop, you're running, you're running Mac OS, or you're running Linux, or you're running Windows. What are all those other CPUs running? A lot of them are probably running the real-time operating system Nucleus, memorably known as Tron. How many of you have heard of the Tron operating system? A couple of people. It is the most popular operating system on the planet, at least as of last count. Thanks again to Professor Sakamura. Okay, we're not gonna talk about Tron itself. The point here is that 
among uh, advanced computer science students were not even aware of the fact of all of these devices and the operating systems that they're running. Hopefully those devices are in the background and are helping you drive to, uh, drive to campus in the morning, helping you prepare meals and so on. They're in the background and they're, because they're working well, they're invisible. Mark Weiser uh, at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center known as PARC, this was the Google of its day back in the 80s uh, and 90s, coined the actual term ubiquitous computing. Ubiquity means sort of everywhere. And Mark was the one who wrote, our computers, and he meant here ubiquitous technology, should be like our childhood. It's an invisible foundation that we rest upon that's quickly forgotten after you learn about it but it's always with us and effortlessly used throughout our lives, and we can call it into the foreground uh, when needed. Um, he was inspired by the name from one of uh, Philip K. Dick's uh, novels called uh, Ubik. Uh, if you're a science fiction fan, I highly recommend uh, this book. Okay, so that's the idea of ubiquitous computing, which helps to orient us to think about how to go about designing this technology. If we're going to create a large number of devices that are sensing and acting in real time in the physical world alongside us, it would be great if we're not aware of what they're, they're doing. Let them do their, their job so we can get on uh, with ours. So how do you make this invisible? How do you create technology that supports us like in our childhood? Well, we're going to draw on this important concept of scaffolding and through the rest of this section of the uh, course. We're gonna come back to scaffolding several times. This is an idea that comes from developmental psychology or the study of child development. Scaffolding is a very important and intimate process that goes on between parents and children where parents either physically or metaphorically support the learner and as the learner starts to signal increasing competence at whatever it is they're trying to learn, which in this case is to walk on their own two feet, the, the instructor the, or the teacher or the parent or the caregiver is sensing the fact, is somehow inferring that the learner is getting better at the task and gradually removes the scaffolding until there is none left. That's the idea. Okay. Tricky thing for uh, the teacher to do. How do you detect growing competence? Okay, if scaffolding is done right, it induces a learning gradient, so a slope up which the learner uh, is climbing and they're getting gradually better and better at the task, right? Uh, a common example of scaffolding from child development are training wheels on a bicycle. If you, uh, if you've never ridden a bicycle and you get on a bicycle without training wheels, there's no gradient. 99% of the ways that you apply force to the pedal, pedals are gonna end in disaster. And there is a very small minority of actions that the pedaler can perform that will keep the bicycle upright and headed in the right direction. How do you find that action, that needle in the haystack, if everything you do causes the bicycle to fall over? You add training wheels, and now 50% of your actions cause the bike to move a little bit forward, and the rest cause the bike not to go anywhere. There's now much more opportunity for the learner to start to experiment with this device and learn about it, and when they finally figure out how to induce motion and balance on the bicycle, you can remove the training wheels. What are some examples of technology that do something similar? Any new software uh, it usually pops up with tips. So when you're learning it, it asks you if you want tips or if you're an advanced user. Absolutely, right? So a lot of software at the beginning says, do you want to be walked through the tutorial or the tips? And you have to click on something to say yes or no, which is fine, but now obviously we've cost the user having to click and say yes or no. Good technology doesn't have to ask the user, but like a good parent is sensing growing competency in the user and removes scaffolding and tips and tutorials as competency increases. I feel like Clippy could have been like an attempt at scaffolding. Clippy, good old Clippy, right? We um, failed miserably at this like task. It doesn't require you to like ask for help, but it's like it will come and say, like it will like figure out that you're trying to do something and maybe struggle with it. Absolutely. So a lot of technology, if it senses that you're struggling, will pop something and ask if you need help, which is 
OK. Other examples? OK, let's try and, for a moment, mentally design some technology to do this scaffolding. You've all probably used GPS uh, on your phone. You turn on GPS, and it tells you how to get from point A to point B. If you turn on sound, uh, a voice tells you, in 1,000 feet, turn left. In 500 feet, turn left. In 250 feet, turn left. If she tells me one more time to turn left, I'm going to throw my phone out the window. right? <laughs> It's all good, it's fine, but could you imagine a GPS system which is sensing growing competency? So I trace the same path a couple days in a row. What is it that is going to tell the GPS whether I've remembered the route and I don't need to be told anymore to turn left? Or I, don't, I was talking to a friend and I, I wasn't paying attention the last time we traced this route, so I still don't know how to get from point A to B. I'd like some verbal uh, help. Of course, GPS could ask and I could say yes or no, but could it infer growing competency? How would a GPS system know whether I'm learning the route or not? Uh, you can sense the car speed. The okay, speed of the car. so we have an accelerometer in the phone. This is probably going to be useful. But how does acceleration, what features of acceleration will, will tell the GPS system whether I know the route or not? Okay. Exactly. We're getting closer, right? Something change in speed, which is by definition acceleration, might be able to tell the system that I know I'm going to turn left soon or not. But it's tricky. What feature of acceleration might tell you that? There's a great example, right? So perhaps she asks a probing question and it causes me to change my acceleration. If she's giving verbal hints and I'm ignoring her and when she speaks my acceleration does not change, that's a sign that maybe I know the route and I don't need any more verbal hints. That's a great observation, right? Paying very careful attention to, in this case, the physical context of driving, either aided or unaided by a GPS device and using that to allow the GPS system to remove scaffolding when it's no longer needed. Because especially in a driving situation, I prefer not to have to look down at my phone and turn off or mute the sound. Right? It would be good if, if this was just intelligently inferred. Absolutely, right? So we could, we could start to use facial recognition. Lots of other features going on in the car that we could exploit to figure out how to intelligently tune the amount of scaffolding provided during route taking. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we're going to come back to this idea of scaffolding several times throughout the rest of the course. And scaffolding is the focus of Deliverable 9. In Deliverable 9, you're going to be adding three scaffolds to your system. Educational software in particular, or education, is all about scaffolding. First scaffold you're going, to be, you, you're going to be applying is challenging the user to sign an increasing number of digits as their performance increases. So instead of creating a system that says, I think you're pretty good at, at uh, digit zero. Would you like to move on to digit one? We're going to try and intelligently infer increasing competence and expose the user to more digits as their competence increases. How can you detect increasing competence given your code base so far? Uh, 
Absolutely, right? So your KNN is going to come in very handy here. Your KNN will be able to tell you whether the user is signing correctly or not. We might average over multiple demonstrations and take some average. Is the average number of correct gestures increasing? Like the example of GPS we just talked about, there's some other additional subtle cues that you might be able to pull out that indicate growing competence. Um, times, you can have like a time map thing within Python um, and track. Um, in the database, how long the person is taking the sign? Exactly. So correctly. Absolutely. So time is going to be very important as we move forward with this uh, technology. I can't remember if we've introduced the time library yet or not. If you haven't, it's very useful. You could measure using the time library the number of seconds that elapse between your system flashing up the digit three and the number of seconds that elapse until the KNN detects or predicts that the user is signing the digit three. How long does it take the user to figure out what to do in addition to how often do they get it right? So there's a double challenge in deliverable nine, which is not just thinking creatively about the scaffold itself, but more importantly, knowing when to apply the scaffolding and when and how to gradually remove it. Okay, uh, second scaffold you'll be adding will increasingly challenge the user to remember the gesture associated with the digit as they improve. So at the beginning, we're going to tell the user how to sign three, four, five, and so on, but we would like to gradually remove the scaffolding of showing them the gesture and forcing them to remember it. Simplest way to do that is obviously to flash up an image of the gesture itself for a shorter period of time. How else might we help our users gradually memorize the gestures associated with the digits? One of the, one of the challenges in scaffolding is not to remove the scaffolding immediately. Take off the training wheels and now we have a learner that's completely unaided. We're always looking for ways to inc include uh, gradients to make this process of learning or memorization in this case as smooth as possible. So we have the image of the space and the sign. The gesture. We have the image of the gesture, the image or a figure or whatever it is. You're showing the user what they should do. Well, we can remove it. Or, you you yeah. can remove it after a shorter and shorter period of time. What else could we do? Absolutely. You could, we could put up an image of the gesture, but you also have the virtual hand itself. You could draw the virtual hand that corresponds to whatever the user is actually doing. You could draw an additional skeletal hand, which is showing what they should be doing, and they are trying to match their virtual hand with the demonstrated hand. Okay, so go from do this to pick which of the two is correct. So recognition rather than remembrance. We talked about that several times already. I, I, three and six, I still get confused after all these years. If you put up two images, I can usually remember which it is, unless the two images are three and six, then I'm still confused. But I can usually pick out the sign for three compared to one, uh, com compared to one or zero, and so on. So we could go from do this to uh, challenging our user to recognize, and then finally to challenging them to remember. Right? That would be adding in a gradual. Uh, learning gradient. Okay, uh, again, in this assignment and all the rest of the assignments, it's up to you to come up with your particular solution. Uh, the third scaffold will increasingly challenge the user to sign that gesture faster as they improve. How, how might you induce a learning gradient here? Um, why not have like a stream of numbers? Okay. And then you have to sign it if you say 126 or like 126, okay. um, they would have to sign like one and two and six. There's a great idea, right? We could get into sequences of numbers and you need to sign them as quickly as possible. Maybe the sequence grows longer as, again, they're able to succeed at this, this task. Okay, any questions about deliverable nine? I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay. 
Okay, so that's scaffolding. Let's have a look at another application. Uh, this one is, is one of the primary applications of ubiquitous uh, computing. Another reminder here of visual design. What are these three population pyramids on the right telling us? Populations are getting older, right? The graying of the global population. These are three population periods at three different points in time for a particular country. Which country is it? United Kingdom. United Kingdom, very good. How did you know? Thank you, the Ministry of Health and Labor spelled properly, okay. Okay, so uh, one of the challenges obviously in manipulating slides, which I'm clearly not very good at. How do I, that's not gonna help us much. Let's try this. <laughs> Let's try this, okay. Okay, so uh, we're gonna look at an application where we're gonna think about trying to deploy ubiquitous technology into the homes uh, of the elderly so we can keep them as independent as possible. Most people would prefer to stay in their homes uh, than in a, a care facility. Uh, and from an economics point of view, this is also useful uh, for, from a social point of view. So here's a little cartoon example here. Uh, we have Miss X who lives uh, alone in her home and her mobility is declining. Family members would like to call and check in with her every once in a while. Uh, if you call and the phone keeps ringing, do you jump in your car and drive over or is everything okay? One potential application would be, to in, would be to stitch a number of sensors into various carpets or flooring throughout uh, the home and write a little bit of code to support this distributed sensor network. If the phone rings and we detect pressure sensors, uh, we detect pressure on the carpets and it's Miss X moving about, uh, we give a, a message saying Miss X is approaching the phone. Uh, if she's almost at the phone, just let the phone ring normally. If the phone continues ringing and there is no detection of movement in the home, perhaps you send out an alert to, to the caregiver. I've drawn this using something known as ERMIA, or Entity Relation Modeling for Information Artifacts. It's a bit of a mouthful, but if you uh, work in industry, you'll probably come up against the uh, ERMIA notation. In ERMIA notation, we're going to use rectangles to represent physical objects uh, in some way. They could be people, they could be non-intelligent devices, they could be intelligent uh, devices. We can have uh, attributes associated with those devices. We can draw edges to connect together objects. And numbers in the corners of connectors represent the one-to-one, one-to-many, or many-to-many -many relationship. So in Miss X's uh, home, she has M carpets. And in each carpet, there are N pressure sensors. Again, this is a little bit cartoonish, but allows us to pretty quickly sketch out an idea for a distribution of people, objects, and technology. What else might we deploy into Miss X's home to increase her independence? Assuming that she is challenged by decreasing mobility. Any ideas? What's the context here that's most relevant? Maybe motion detect detection. Motion detection, okay, so we're trying to detect motion. Yeah, see um, is it the, in which house and how she moves. Okay, so maybe motion detectors in the rooms to detect motion. If we want to detect X, Miss X's motion, what's the easiest way to do it? Have, her, have a wearable sensor. 
Maybe Miss X is not willing to wear that technology, right? The easiest solution to keeping people independent in their homes is to turn their homes into Big Brother, right? Sensors everywhere, uh, on the person, uh, in the person in some cases. However, again, that may be the most, uh, that may be the easiest way to solve the problem, but from Miss X's point of view, it may be unacceptable, right? that someone is watching at all times. Again, we've talked about acceptability. This is a difficult thing to get right uh, in this domain, but again, from a healthcare perspective, very, very important and increasingly important. Okay, again, just something to, to think about. Okay, lecture 16 is a little short, uh, so we're gonna move on now to lecture 17. In lecture 17, we're gonna look at the first of these three applications where we're going to try and apply ubiquitous technology. We're gonna look at some investigators that deployed ubiquitous technology to pose and try and answer a scientific question that would be difficult or impossible otherwise. The first one we're gonna look at is social network inference. So if you give me all your, your Instagram accounts, I can use those to know your social network, at least that part of it that's on Instagram. Assuming I don't have access to your social network and I just interact with you physically in an informal manner on campus, how might I infer the social networks that exist among this class? Let's have a look at an application of this. In this case, the investigators wanted to ask the following question. Could you use ubiquitous technology, computing technology to extract face-to-face -face information? So not uh, tweets and Instagram posts, but look at face-to-face -face in information from social groups and learn about how people behave towards one another in this social network. Okay, that's the starting point. Let's talk a little bit about the experimental design. We're gonna just talk about this at a high level. For those of you that are interested, you can go and have a look at the research paper uh, itself. Uh, there were 24 graduate students who were not involved in the study. They were graduate students from a different lab. Uh, these were very uh, accommodating graduate students. They were willing to wear, back in, the, in 2008, this sensor pack, which you can see is on this strap, uh, going around the back and tellingly this sensor uh, this sensor array is close to the speaker's mouth and also close to their ear they agreed to wear it for a six month period the sensors recorded what the speakers spoke but it threw away all the information of the content of speech. We're gonna see this several times in many of these uh, applications. For important privacy reasons, we are not gonna be recording what the person wearing the sensor said, what the person they were talking to said, or most importantly, a third person walking by who knows nothing about this application or this uh, project is also not gonna record what they said. We're gonna just record, in this case, the volume of their, of their speech and what's known as prosody, the way in which they spoke. And we'll, we'll talk more about prosody uh, in a moment. Okay. Given the speech data, we're gonna collect how people spoke, how these 24 people spoke over a six month period. Can we infer from that, first of all, can we learn a social network? Among the 24 grad students, which grad students know each other better than others or are more friendly towards one another? And if we can infer this social network, can we ask unique questions that would be difficult or impossible to ask in a social science setting? Or questions that would be difficult or impossible to ask even if I had complete access to all of your Instagram and Twitter and Facebook accounts, which is, Given your position in the social network, does it alter the way that you behave or the way that you speak in that network? This is a question that's been on social scientists' minds for a long time. Where are you within a social hierarchy? Do you know where you are in that social hierarchy? And does your position or your knowledge of that position alter how you speak to others at different positions in the social hierarchy among a social group? So we're gonna focus on the technology, but most importantly, we're trying to think about how to use this technology to try and answer a question that's difficult to do otherwise. 
Okay, so what's in this uh, sensor uh, pack? There was a, a number of sensors, uh, accelerometers, uh, infrared and visible light, digital compass, temperature, barometric pressure, humidity, most of which probably are irrelevant to social interaction. We're gonna focus on just the microphone and only focus on how people are speaking to one another. So right at the point of capture, the microphone itself, the moment that the text, uh, the speech is captured, we're gonna throw away the contents of speech so that we're not recording speech, putting it on a hard drive and then throwing away the speech later. So it's an important part of these scientists being allowed to do this experiment in the first place. And we're gonna store on the device itself just the speech statistics, the statistics of prosody, the way that they speak. Okay, importantly, the subjects were not wearing the devices all day, every day for six months. They were only wearing them during working hours, one week per month for six months. Okay. Let's dive into some of the data. Maybe I should maximize this so it'll be a little easier to see. Okay, we've got five panels here, which as you can see, top to bottom, represent the days of the working week. The horizontal axes range from nine in the morning till eight at night. And in this time span, we're gonna break this time span into five minute buckets. And inside each of these five minute buckets, we're gonna look across the speech statistics that we obtained from those 24 graduate students. And within that bucket, we're gonna measure PSS or person second speaking. Imagine that within that five minute interval, all 23 graduate students are sitting quietly in the library. They're not speaking and they don't hear anybody speaking. But one of the graduate students is involved in conversation with someone outside this social group and they're speaking for uh, three minutes out of that, uh, three minutes out of that five minute period, three times 60 is 180, 180 person second speaking seconds. Assume all 24 graduate students are speaking for 10 seconds, only 10 seconds during that five minute period, 24 graduate students each spoke for 10 seconds, 24 times 10, 240, person second speaking. So it's not how many people were speaking, just the total amount of speech that was going on among those 24 students during this period. Okay, just given that data alone, you can already start to infer something about this group. What is it? Actually, you can infer several things about this group. Remember, as always in HCI, we're starting to think about context, right? What, what are these graduate students doing? How are they behaving? How are they speaking? What can you tell me about the context here? Why the tall blocks Tuesday and Thursday morning? Maybe they're in a meeting with each other and they're all talking. Maybe they're all in a meeting with one another. With each other, maybe they're all in a meeting apart. Maybe they're all in a meeting apart, but then why this regularity of Tuesday and Thursday morning if they're apart? Um, well, generally, I'd say like they all seem to share a schedule, at least in some ways, with like those mansion blocks or the Friday trends or the Monday trends. They, for some reason, they all seem to be matching up in some way. Which, again, from context, you'd, you'd sort of imagine, right? So I said 24 graduate students. Graduate students is a much smaller pool than the undergraduate pool. So they're probably taking similar courses and seminars and they're probably together Tuesday and Thursday morning, right? It would be unlikely that they're all in different places and it's just at this particular time that there's a lot of speech. Let's assume they are together Tuesday and Thursday morning. Are they in a lecture or are they in a seminar? Seminar, why a seminar? Because there's so many persons, there's so many seconds speaking there that there's definitely multiple people contributing. Absolutely, so importantly, as I mentioned before, the microphone is very near their mouth and near their ear. So this device is able to distinguish between are they talking or are they listening to somebody else talking? And PSS is only measuring them talking. It throws away for the moment information about somebody else 
talking. So the 24 graduate students themselves are doing much more talking Tuesday and Thursday morning than they are as a group on average the rest of the working week. Right? So we're already starting to infer something about this, this group, not necessarily about social dynamics yet. Okay, so let's have a look now at starting to zero in on social interaction. Let's imagine an example here. So at a particular point in time, imagine we have three of the speakers that are uh, in a classroom or they're together somewhere, they're in a coffee shop, and the three of them are involved in a conversation. Outside that room in a neighboring hallway, speakers four and five are also in conversation. Imagine further that the conversation inside the room, uh, just before it finishes, the conversation out in the hall starts up. So we have two separate conversations among two different groups with different numbers of members in each of those two groups. And the time at which those conversations occur is overlapping. We don't know that, however, we just have the microphone data. right? So what might that microphone data look like if we collect the data from f these five speakers? We might notice that for a certain period, uh, for a certain period, speaker one's volume is high and then their volume is medium. Same thing for speaker two and speaker three. And we might notice that this non-zero volume or medium and high volume covers the same period of time. It suddenly grows silent for all three, or at least there's no more speaking. They go into, they go into a quiet study session or something else happens and the conversation ends. Same thing for speaker four and five. How would we take this raw data and discover that in fact, the first three speakers were in conversation and then speakers four and five? Well, if you could say that speakers three and four were in conversation because they're speaking at the Speakers three and four, possibly, they're, they're definitely speaking at the same time. There are conversations where people are speaking yeah. at the same time. It's a good start. They match up, right? So I arranged these five plots vertically as a hint, right? We're looking for temporal coincidence. Things are occurring at the same time, right? We might have people that are actually speaking at the same time, but are still doing it as part of a conversation face to face with one another. So how do we look for this temporal coincidence? We're gonna use, or the investigators use something known as mutual information. We're not gonna go into the mathematical foundations of mutual information. For our purposes, it's like correlation. It tells us about the mutual dependence between two variables. So let's apply this idea of mutual information. Let's start to march from left to right along these five panels. And at each point in time, we're gonna pick one of the five panels and take the, uh, the amount of volume and compare it against the amount of volume in the other four panels among the other four speakers. And we might notice, for example, that there is high mutual information actually just during this period here. During this period, whenever speaker two's volume is high, the speakers for the other two volumes register medium volume for that period. So another way to think about mutual information is whenever I measure one thing, in this case, high volume for speaker two, I can be confident if there's high volume here, I can predict medium volume for speaker one and, and speaker three, and at least within this time interval, I'm always right. That's mutual information. So there's high mutual information here, there's also high mutual information during this time period. I can be confident that whenever speaker three's volume is high, speaker one's volume and speaker two's volume is medium. So among these three speakers, as I march from left to right during just this period, there is high mutual information. The particular correlation between whose volume is high and whose is medium changes 
but mutual information is high. If we look at this time period here, and we look at speaker four, speaker four's volume is always high, but I cannot be confident that the high volume for speaker four predicts the volume of speaker three. There is low mutual information between speaker four and speaker three during this period. So you can imagine, as I'm computing mutual information during this time period, the distance between speaker three and speaker four is increasing. The more mutual information I detect between volume levels of different graduate students for the same slice of time, the more confident I can be that they're in a conversation, even if they're speaking over one another. So far, so good? Okay, so that's how we're starting to go from raw volume information to social network inference. So if I take just these five graduate students, I can be confident that at least for this time period, these three speakers were in a conversation. So there's some, we're gonna set some threshold, and if, me, if mean of mutual information goes above that threshold, I predict these people were in a conversation. And I'm gonna represent it using a social network. So in a social network, we have nodes and edges. The nodes represent people, and the edges represent some social relationship between them. In this case, in our purposes, an edge is going to represent that that pair of uh, graduate students was involved in a face-to-face -face conversation with each other for some period of time. We don't know whether they're friends, we don't know if they're competitors, we don't know if they're arguing with one another, or agreeing, we don't know anything else. We only know they were together in the same place and they were involved in a conversation together. If we repeat this process over lots of these time slices throughout this six month period, we can detect multiple conversations among different subsets of the grad graduate students uh, at different points in time. Every time, we every time we predict a conversation, we're gonna add an edge to our network of 24 nodes. If we go to add an edge, like between S1 and S3, and there's already an edge there, then we assign a number to that edge, which is two. So we're gonna now have a weighted social network. So the edges have weights, the weights are integers, and the integers represent the number of distinct conversations that that pair of graduate students were involved in face to face. Okay, so now we've gone from raw volume information to a final network, which is our prediction about a particular kind of social dynamic. How often were they involved in conversation with one another? Okay, that social network inference, that's step one. Now that we do that, can we start to ask questions about social dynamics? That would have been difficult or impossible to do before. What we're going to look at now is we're going to look at now not just, uh, not just we used volume to infer the social network. Uh, we're now going to use four other features of prosody, four other ways in which they spoke, but not what they said. And we're going to see whether their position in this social network that we just constructed, if that correlates with the way that they speak to other members of the group. We're gonna look at rate, how quickly did they speak, pitch, did they speak high frequency, low frequency, turn length, how long did somebody speak before they ceded the floor to somebody else, and within a given conversation, what was the turn frequency? How short were the intervals during which one member's volume was high and the other volumes were medium? Okay, so let's start with the hypothesis. People change their normal way of speaking more when they speak to strangers than with good friends. Okay, so there's several nouns in this sentence that we're going to have to pin down using metrics or data. So what do we mean by their normal way of speaking? Uh, and what do we mean by strangers and good friends? Let's start to test this hypothesis by computing uh, uh, B, I slash J. What that mean, B is gonna represent one of these four features of prosody. 
And we're going to ask about I, the person that's speaking. So among these 24 graduate students, we can pick one at random. That's graduate student I. And we can then look at this speech frequency, or this speech feature, such as rate. How fast did I speak? How fast did I speak when they were speaking to everyone else in the social network, all the other 22 graduate students? How fast did they speak? And compare that to, uh, uh, sorry, just take the mean of that rate. So how quickly did they speak to the other 22 graduate students? Then we can ask for the same graduate student I, how fast did they speak when they spoke to J, the 24th graduate student? So how did they speak to a whole bunch of other people in the group? And J. We can then also compute S sub I, which is the standard deviation of the speech feature. So for a given graduate student I, if they have high standard deviation, sometimes they speak slowly, sometimes they speak quickly. If another graduate student I has low standard deviation, they tend to always speak at the same speed. Humans differ in lots of different ways. We all have different ways in which we change how we speak. Okay, we're gonna put these three variables together to compute dij. And DIJ is going to represent the amount or how much I's speech changes when speaking with J. Right? So we're taking the, their mean rate of speech. We're subtracting out their rate of speech when they talk to J. If they speak to J at the exact same speed as they talk to everybody else, these two B's will be equal, cancel each other out, and will be near zero. And we're going to normalize, we're going to divide by standard deviation. We're going to try and ask how the rate of speech changes for all 24 graduate students. But some of those grad students, their rate changes more compared to other graduate students. And that part we're not interested in. It's a confounding variable. So we're going to get rid of it by normalizing by S sub i. So far, so good? Okay, so we know that dij, if it's zero, that means i doesn't change the way they speak when speaking to j compared to everybody else. If dij is high, is positive, the, the higher it is, the more they change their speech compared to j. Okay. We're then going to compare d with c, the fraction of time that i speaks with j. Okay, so now we've got C and D, the amount of time they talk to J and how they change their speaking behavior when speaking with J. And we can then go look for a correlation between C and D. And it turns out that for all four, if we repeat this process, for all four of these features of prosody, there is a negative correlation. The higher C is, the lower D is, and vice versa. Does that prove, does that provide support for the hypothesis or evidence against the hypothesis? It proves it, right? How so? How does C and D relate to this hypothesis? That's right. So good friends is a bit of a subjective term here, right? We should really replace good friends with people they often speak with during the six-month period. Yeah. So there's a correlation that uh, even if it's negative, there's still a correlation that says, um, oh, yeah, uh, your, the way you speak to someone changes when uh, you're more familiar with them. Exactly, right? So let's take that example. The more you speak with someone, that means CIJ is higher, you speak with them a lot, and D is lower. We're looking at, there's a detected anti-correlation here. High C, low D. I know someone very well, I talk to them a lot, and my D is low. The way I speak to them is the way I usually speak to other people in the group. Maybe more tellingly is the opposite. When C is low, 
I'm speaking to one of the other 23 graduate students that I rarely speak to during this six month period. C is low, D is high. However I normally speak, I'm now speaking differently to that person than I do on average to the other people in the group. Okay, as I mentioned, this correlation is negative. There's an anti-correlation for all of these. So I change my rate of speech when I'm speaking to a stranger in the group. I change my pitch. I change turn length. Doesn't say whether I speak more or less. I just change my turn length. Same thing with turn frequency. We're gonna end today by just talking briefly about P. P is, in statistics, a probability that our result is false, the null hypothesis. So maybe we're wrong. Maybe when C goes up, D actually doesn't go down. The probability that I'm wrong if C and D relate to rate is extremely low, it's near zero. So I can be pretty confident that rate changes when I speak to a stranger. P is also low for pitch. I can be pretty sure that the pitch of my speech changes when I speak to a stranger. I can also be confident of it for turn length. P here is above 0.05, which for most statisticians makes them nervous. I would probably reject that one. Turn frequency, I, the grad students are probably not changing that one in the response, uh, in, in conversation with strangers. Quick question. Turn frequency like, necessarily be linked to turn length, though? Uh, possibly. They might, be, they might be related. That's a good point. OK, you have a quiz due tonight. You're working on Deliverable 9, and I will see you on Thursday. <laughs>